Good morning. So uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to grab that, and uh, I would love for you to be in two places, Matthew chapter 5, put a tab there, and then also look for Matthew chapter 19. And I would, if you don't have a, a Bible, maybe you got a smartphone, something like that, I would love for you to just follow along as we walk through our text this morning together. While you're looking for that, um, I just want to say thank you for having me. It is a real treasure and a delight to be with you because as, as uh, Pastor Jeremiah said, we hit it off like brothers and we talked about our churches and I'm going to tell you something you already know. You have such a gift in Pastor Jeremiah and he loves Jesus and he loves his local church and now I get the opportunity to see all the people that he spoke of so affectionately. So a real delight for me to be in this place. Um, as I start this morning, I want to acknowledge that we're talking about a rather difficult and divisive topic, and that is the topic of divorce. Um, many of you know the statistics on marriage. One in every two marriages ends in divorce. And even as we look at statistics, that does very little to divulge the pain of a divorce if you've ever experienced one. So knowing those statistics, some of you here may have experienced it personally, or you have a parent or parents who have gone through a divorce, or maybe a sibling or a classmate or a coworker. Someone in your life has experienced this. And for those of you who have, you know that it's not just like a separation, it's more like a death. But here's the difference. Typically, when a loved one passes away, all of your family, they fly from all over around the world, they come into your home, they take over your calendar, they set up a meal train, they just flood you with love and support. But oftentimes, when people walk through a divorce, it feels like the opposite of that. Maybe if you've experienced this uh, family members might withdraw from you, or there's a feeling of, am, am I going to take sides? You feel ostracized. You feel that scarlet letter. And so there's a lot of pain that comes with divorce. Many of you, if, if you've experienced this, you know it's many years in the separation, and then it's many more years in adjustment afterwards. And so it's very, very difficult. I often think of the psalmist who says this, Psalm chapter 6, I'm worn out from all of my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and I drench my couch with tears. So I want to just recognize on the front end that whenever we talk about such topics, we're talking about people who are made in God's image and who have been through a lot. And it's very difficult. And so I just want to acknowledge that, that we have some work to do this morning. It might not be pleasant to walk through, kind of like a chiropractor appointment. I'm like you, chiropractors, mm, don't like going there. But my hope is that by the end of our time today, you will see that no matter what you're walking through, no matter what you've been through, there is hope for you in the person of Jesus. And when we met in a huddle before the service, uh, we talked about how this topic, it's not just for married people or divorced people. It, it's ultimately for all people, and, and I hope you see that. I, I hope you see the gospel shine through in Jesus' words this morning. So if you got your Bible, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 19, and uh, we're going to walk through this together. Matthew 19, and the reason we're doing this is because this is Jesus' fleshed-out teaching on the topic of, of divorce. We, we heard our preaching text, Matthew chapter 5, those two verses, but this is a more fleshed-out explanation of Jesus' view on marriage and on divorce. And so here's the context, verse 3. Some Pharisees came to test Jesus. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? This is what you might call a not very honest pastoral question. That is a trap, all right? So this is one of those questions that regardless of how Jesus answers... There's going to be someone angry. Now, this is not a perfect example, but let me give you one uh, in our recent history. Jeremiah is going to appreciate this one. It would be akin to someone coming up to a pastor in the year 2020 and saying, Pastor, Jesus' command to love your neighbor, does that mean you should get the COVID-19 vaccine? Hmm, 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 hmm. 
And you just know, like, regardless of what answer he gives, someone's going to be angry. There's going to be a visceral response to that sort of question, depending on where you land. And so this is one of those heated questions. Pharisees, they're trying to trap Jesus so that they can get rid of Jesus. And then Jesus answers, verse 4, haven't you read that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and, f- and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So I want you to see the absolute genius of what Jesus does here. So when, when he's asked that question, Jesus essentially goes, no, it's not okay for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason. Why? On the basis, I want you to see this, of God's created design in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. He goes back to the creation mandate in order to give the foundation for everything that he's going to teach on this. So he quotes Genesis chapter 22, and he says that marriage is designed to be a lifelong exclusive covenant, a partnership between a man and a woman until death. That, that's what he's framing in this story. So marriage, a way of thinking about this, marriage is not just a human construct, right? So the, the season of Canadian Thanksgiving, that's a human construct, right? Um, the company Microsoft, a human construct. The building we find ourselves in, the, the chairs you're sitting on, each of these things are human constructs. So if after the service we had a debate with each other, Thanksgiving, Ham or turkey? Who are the ham people? Anyone? No, all a couple of you. Turkey, who are the turkey people? No offense to the people who raised their hand first, but you're right, they're wrong. Okay, it's turkey. Uh, But, you know, that's okay. God doesn't really care about that. He's not too concerned with the outcome of that. That's a human construct. Or if we talk about the debate between PC and Mac, I'm, I'm an old man, right? I'm, I'm 35. I'm older than most of you in this room, which is really weird. I don't think I've ever had this before. Um, but those are human constructs. We can talk about those things. Marriage is made by God. So think about this with me. Let's say you went out and you bought a brand new Cadillac, beautiful car. It can go from zero to 60 in like 5.3 seconds. Beautiful car. You own it. It's yours. And you decide, you know what? I'm not going to put gas in the vehicle. I'm going to put in Hershey's maple syrup. Your friends, they all tell you, don't do that. You're going to break the car. You say, I don't care. It's my car. I'm going to do with it what I please. Here's what we got to see. We have to adhere to the guiding principles of those who made the car. Otherwise, it'll break down. It'll break down. You own the car, right? You bought it. It belongs to you, but you have to adhere to the manner in which it was made. And in the same way, that's what God is, is communicating in the essence of marriage is I made it in a certain way so that it would function best. And when you don't do that, it comes at the expense of the way in which I made it and it breaks down. So that's the essence of what he's trying to communicate, the foundation for marriage. But the Pharisees, they don't care because like I said to you already, they're trying to trap Jesus. They know Jesus. They knew how he was going to respond. And so as of this moment, they're just pumped that Jesus acted the way that he did. He responded the way that he did. And they had a second question ready to go. That's verse seven. Why then, they asked, Did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? So they're quoting Deuteronomy chapter 24. Let me read that to you. It says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and then the next five verses, you can read the context later, says, in essence, he could write her a certificate of divorce. So here's here's the logic. Follow the logic of the Pharisees. Jesus... If you are saying that we shouldn't get divorced, then you are contradicting Moses. And if you're contradicting Moses, you're contradicting the Bible. And if you're contradicting the Bible, then you're a false teacher. And if you're a false teacher, then you must be put to death. Anyone like uh, NBA Jam? Any NBA Jam fans? In the words of NBA Jam, boom shakalaka. That's what they're excited about. Checkmate. 
got you, pinned you down, Jesus. Now, hot tip, you should never get into a battle of wits against Jesus, the creator of the universe. But they're going to learn this the hard way. Verse 8, Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. See, he keeps going back to the creation story. He keeps going back to that shalom place when God created the world and all things were good. That's what he's highlighting for us. So according to first century Roman law, a man could divorce his wife for literally any reason. Women couldn't do that, but men could. They could do it for whatever reason they wanted. And then within that culture, uh, all the, the Jewish community, they were trying to figure out, okay, how do we see the covenant of marriage? How do we view it according to what we now call the Old Testament, what they simply called scripture? What are we to believe? And there were two different kind of rules of thought, two different schools of thought on this. The first was Rabbi Shammai. And he said something indecent only meant sexual indecency, meaning a divorce was permitted in instances of unrepentant sexual unfaithfulness. This is what you might call the, the conservative position. And then the opposing position came from a man not named Rabbi Hillel. And he said that indecent meant anything that you didn't like about her. Anything at all. Indecent behavior, indecent cooking skills, you know, she lets herself go, like burn the toast, anything, you're out. And that might sound humorous, but here's exactly what he said. Rabbi Hillel says, if she consistently burns the bread, erwat debar, which means you may divorce her. Those two Hebrew words, erwat debar, that's what something indecent in Deuteronomy 24 ultimately means. Erwat debar, you, you may divorce her. And this might come as no surprise to you, but most of the Jewish men in this culture and in this community sided with Rabbi Hillel. Because after all, who wants to be locked into an institution? You don't know how it's going to go. Maybe in five years, you're going to find out, I don't really like this person. Or, you know, we, we don't see eye to eye on certain things. And so, hey, it was, it was good, but now we got to get out of it. Who wants to be locked into something until death? So Jewish men in this culture were like, well, if a rabbi says it, then, then that's what I'm going to believe. That's what I'm going to follow. But Jesus, he comes down pretty decidedly on the quote, unquote, conservative position. In fact, you have to see this. He elevates it. He elevates it. He says, not only is it wrong to divorce someone because you just want out of the marriage, but as we heard the text from Matthew chapter 5, if you get remarried, it's adultery. That's the teaching of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. This really difficult, enigmatic teaching from Jesus. So let's give ourselves a, a bit of a recap up to this point. The Pharisees, they asked this question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus says no. And um, if you want to look at the context later, Paul also doubles down on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul says no. Jesus says no. Paul says no. And I think that probably leads to a second question. What are the instances then in which it is permissible to get a divorce? What are, what are the exceptions to the rule? And I'll, I'll give you two, two that we find in the New Testament. Jesus says it's permissible in cases of unrepentant marital unfaithfulness, right? That's, that's Matthew 19, that's Matthew 5. And then Paul expands that list in 1 Corinthians 7, when he references desertion by an unbeliever. Very quickly, the context here is this tiny little church in Corinth. Many people are coming to the faith, many of them being women. And they are in a marriage relationship with an unbeliever. And, and they're asking the pastors of this church, should we get divorced and you know, go and marry one of the Christian men in this congregation? What should we do? And here's Paul's instruction. He says, in essence... You are the only gospel your husband will ever see. You're the only gospel your kids are ever going to see. Stay in the marriage. Stay in the marriage for the sake of their souls. But if they leave you, let them go. If you leave them, let them go. So these are, these are the two exceptions that we find in Scripture. 
So that probably leads to a third question. And, you know, I have uh, four children. And so this is a question I get a lot. Why? Why? So why would cases of adultery and desertion be exceptions to the rule? What's going on in that? Like, what are we to understand about the gospel? What are we to understand about the, the nature and the essence of marriage with these two things being the exception to the rule? And, and here's what I want you to see today. This is why this message is for single people, married people, divorced people, remarried people. Every single person needs to hear this message because it points to the essence of the gospel. Jesus' explanation is all about the gospel. So we have to see that rationale. It, um, Matthew chapter 19, I'd like us to go back and look at it a little bit more closely. And if you're looking at your Bible, notice that the Pharisees ask a question about divorce, but Jesus doesn't actually answer the question. Instead, he elevates it and he talks about the essence of marriage. Do you see that? So he doesn't really answer the divorce question. He says, here's what marriage is all about. So let me ask you a question. What makes marriage marriage? Is it feelings of love and affection? And when you like fall in love with someone, you should marry them? Like I'm telling you, if you have a dog, your dog loves you. Your dog would die for you probably. Like dogs are just so loyal, but like that's not a marriage, right? Love is a part of it, but love, but marriage in its essence is a choice to covenant yourself to someone. This is what Jesus says in verse 5. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united, see that word, to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Uh, other translations use the word to cleave. This is the Greek word kolau, which literally means to be glued to something, or better yet, to be grafted or welded to something. That is the essence of every single time a Jewish community talked about covenants, they're talking about kolau. They're talking about being welded, being grafted. There used to be two things. Now there's one thing. That's the nature of a covenant. So picture this. You got two balls of clay. Maybe one's blue, the other one's red. You put them all together, and then you turn it into an elaborate piece of pottery, and then you throw it into a 1,500-degree kiln. You know at the end of that process, it's something new entirely. You can't undo that. You can't change it. You can't go back. It used to be two. Now it's one. That is the nature of Kalau. That's the nature of covenant. That's the essence of marriage. So then why, why is God so concerned about marriage? Why is it so important to him? Because after all, if, if I can just look out at the world right now, I think the way that we think about sex and marriage is sex is knocking boots, having a good time. And marriage is we're, we're going in the same direction, right? My father-in-law, Ernie, and myself, we, we came here from Abbotsford. We're driving in the same direction. So we took a car together all the way to Vancouver. But, you know, if he had somewhere else to go later on today and I had somewhere else to go, I'd say, hey, see you later, you know, and he goes to there and I go there. That's kind of our view on marriage is we got a good partnership going on here. Let's see it. Let's see it ride. This benefits me. And I think that's the cultural perspective or worldview of what marriage is in our cultural collective psyche. But Jesus has something different. He thinks about something vastly different about marriage. He is so serious about covenants. If you read your Bible and you're looking through all the pages of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, one thing that really sticks out is we serve a covenant-keeping God. He is so ferociously faithful. It's something that even after a couple of decades of following Jesus, just speaks to my soul is that we serve a faithful God. And so in, in my congregation, we always do fill in the blanks, but I, I think we have something here on the screen for you. Here's the covenant principle. We serve a ferociously faithful, covenant-keeping God, despite the fact that we rarely reciprocate. Isn't that true? 
we rarely reciprocate. That is the gospel in a nutshell. That we were not faithful and God was faithful to us. Let me give you one example of this. There's so many from scripture, but let me just share one. This is the story of Hosea, who was a prophet during a time in which Israel was being unfaithful. And this is the command that God gives Hosea at the beginning of the book. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. And I would imagine at this point, Hosea was experiencing a case of a mistaken identity. He'd probably be asking, God, um, it, doesn't your word say that we shouldn't commit adultery? Do I really have to marry this woman? Can't, can't I just be a friend to her? And God, in essence, says, yes, you have to marry her. Because at the end of the day, when you are tired and weary of helping her, taking care of all of her needs, you know, if she's sick, you're catching the puke in the bucket, you know, holding back the hair, doing all the things to care for her. At the end of the day, her problems are still her problems. At the end of the day, when you're tired and weary, you can just say, signing off, I'm out. But here's what I want you to see. I am a ferociously faithful God. I want you to marry the most dysfunctional prostitute that I can find. And I want your happiness to be clung to her happiness. I want your joy to be clung to her joy. I want her sadness to be clung to your sadness. And in that way, you will know what it's like to be like me. A God of an unfaithful, unrepentant people. I want you to feel it. I want you to know it deep in your bones. They, they are repeatedly unfaithful to me. Despite the fact that I have always, always, always been a covenant-keeping God. I've been so faithful to them. And they will not reciprocate. They keep going after their false idols. They keep going after other gods. They do not worship me. Now, here's where the story goes from sad to worse. Despite Hosea's love, despite his romance, despite his care and trying to help her flourish, Gomer, his wife, repeatedly betrays him and cheats on him and runs off with other lovers. And the climax of the story is a great famine hits the land of Israel. And in order to fend for himself, Gomer's lover sells her into slavery so that he can earn a quick buck. Now, here's the question. Who will fend for her now? She has broken the cord from the only person who's ever loved her, who's ever cared for her. So do you really think, Hosea, after being repeatedly betrayed and cheated on, that, that he's going to come back and buy her back from the auction? Who in their right mind would do that? And yet, God says, that's exactly what you're going to do, Hosea. And so Hosea, he sells the vast majority of his possessions. Then he has enough money. He goes to the market and he buys his wife back. His unfaithful wife, he buys her back from the auction. And we see this story find its ultimate culmination in the person of Jesus. He goes to the cross, scorning its shame, so that we can be set free. That is the reason why, friends, we call Jesus our Redeemer. Do you know what Redeemer means? He buys us back, though we do not deserve it. He buys us back. And so here's the application. Here's the reason why Jesus' teaching on adultery and unfaithfulness and divorce matters for every single person in this room and this is the way that I put it. Since God is a covenant-keeping God, we are to be covenant-keeping people. I want you to see, if you have your Bibles uh, still open, look at Matthew chapter 5. I want you to see the sequence of what Jesus talks about in his Sermon on the Mount. So my understanding, last week uh, you heard the message on adultery. Is that right? And then from adultery, he goes to divorce. And then from divorce, what does he go to next? What's the topic? Does anyone have it in front of you? Oaths. Isn't that interesting? Adultery, divorce, oaths. 
And I think as Westerners, we think those are three different topics. But to Jesus, they're one and the same. It's all about covenant. It's all about covenant. That's what he's trying to frame for his people is I want you to be covenant keeping people in everything you do in your business place, in your marriage, in your relationships, and how you treat your finances. I want you to be covenant-keeping people. And so this is the reason why Jesus cares so much about marriage. The essence of marriage is covenant. And therefore, marriage is a window into the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. I, I would dare say that marriage is the best visible example of covenant that we have today. The best one where we can see what it looks like to have two parties make a lifelong exclusive partnership with each other in which they say, in life and in death, in sickness and in health, I'm with you. I'm with you. One story, we don't have time to look at it today, but you might consider writing it down and looking at the context later. Genesis chapter 15 in which God makes a covenant with Abraham. He shows up in the smoke of a fire fire pot and a blazing torch. They walk through slaughtered animals. But a really interesting element of the story is Abraham never walks through to make the covenant. Only God does. So here's the essence of the gospel that we see fulfilled in Jesus. He, in in, in essence, says, if I break my end of the covenant, may my blood be shed. But if you break your end of the covenant. May my blood be shed. That's the God that we serve. He is a ferociously faithful God. And I think the best encapsulation of this in in the whole Bible is what we find in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, that's the cross, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their own body just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then he says something so remarkable. We're talking about marriage, right? Isn't that the whole topic that he's talking about? This is what he says next. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Wait, 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 wait. I thought we were talking about marriage. Weren't we just talking about marriage? When when did we start talking about the gospel? When did we start talking about the church? And Paul says, the whole time. Because they're one and the same. The whole time. And so we we see this ultimately in uh, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 16, when God says, I married you when you were of age. I covered you with my robe. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord. I pledged my faithfulness to you, and you became mine. And so I think that's the reason why God makes such a big deal about marriage and covenant and faithfulness, because it is a window into a divine reality. It is a window into the gospel. And only in light of all of that information will we have the capacity to understand what Jesus says about divorce. Jesus is saying that if you truly understand marriage as this deep unity and oneness, this this covenanting, then you will discover that divorce is much less like taking off an article of clothes and more like removing a a limb from your body. Actually, it's more than that. It's more like... A death, a death, which is why, by the way, I think we should display such tremendous compassion to those who have walked through one because they've experienced a death. And so it's not something that we should revel in or, you know, point the finger, but to express such tremendous heartache and pain for them. So here's a way of thinking about this. Uh, Imagine if a doctor 
came into his office every single day um, into an operating room, and the only method he ever wanted to use was to amputate. Could you imagine? So like, he, he says something like this. You got a hangnail? Amputate. Right? Uh, sprained ankle? Let's amputate that thing. Varicose veins? Let's get rid of those. Amputate. Tattoo, an old tattoo from your youth that you're kind of ashamed of. We could remove that, or we could amputate. So like, I, I hope you see the nuance in this. Amputation is sometimes required, isn't it? But it is always, 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 always a last resort. It's a last resort when you've tried everything else. And so divorce can happen, it does happen, and sometimes it happens for good reasons. But the message of scripture, according to Jesus, is that it should always be a last resort, like an amputation. So here's why all of this is so important to our understanding of difficult marriage and divorce, because if we are to say that covenant is the essence of marriage, then we can now see how both adultery and desertion have killed that covenant. When, when your spouse chooses to leave you and to be unfaithful to you, they've broken the covenant. And when an unbeliever deserts you and, and they run off and they leave, that's breaking of the covenant, right? So all of that is the logical sequence, the, the permissible action in the case of our own brokenness, the brokenness of our world, the, the sinful nature that we all have and we all carry. So there are instances in which it is necessary. So perhaps at this point, you might be asking this question for yourself, maybe even for a friend. And I think this is really where the boots hit the ground. You might say something, Justin, what if there's no adultery, technically no divorce by an unbeliever, but what if my spouse is abusive? Or what if I, I know someone in which their spouse is being abusive to them? Here, here's what I, I, I got to say. When I preached this in my congregation, I, I devoted 15 minutes to this whole topic, and, and I'm not doing that today, but I want to give you two things, Okay. Number one, if you are in that situation, you should definitely get out of it immediately. And then number two, I know Pastor Jeremiah, he is a great and godly man. Go and talk to your pastor. Have that conversation as quickly as possible. And I think that will serve you really, really well. And he'll have resources for you to help guide you in that process. There's so much more to say on that, but I think that's where it starts and you can have nuanced conversations with them. I just don't want to gloss over that because I know that it is alive and well in many instances. So one thing that's been really challenging in ministry for me, this is just a sidebar, but it's so important, especially for those of you who are married, is that I have found that more often than not, when I have pastoral conversations with conflicted couples, the divorce papers are already filed. And we want to speak with integrity and being the best pastors that we can be to our congregation. But when it's gotten to that far, it is so incredibly difficult because there's already so much baggage in that moment. And so one thing that I tell my congregation is you should treat your marriage the same way you treat your car. Isn't it sad that oftentimes we have no qualms about getting an oil change? There it goes. Uh, getting an oil change, uh, fixing up our car. And yet we don't treat our marriages that way. Why do we treat our cars better than our marriages? And so if you need help, get some premarital counseling, get some marital counseling, and walk with your spouse in those things. It will serve you well. All right, I want to ask one more question, and then we're going to close. I think this is a question that a lot of people ask. If I am divorced... How does God see me? How does God see me? And as painful and as stigmatic as divorce can be for so many people, even God himself has the audacity to call himself a divorced person. We read of this in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8. For all the adulteries of that faithful Israel, I sent her away with a decree of divorce. So I, I want you to see the nuance in this. In one sense, 
the sanctity of marriage should be preserved and promoted at almost every cost. That even as both married and single people, we should seek to uphold the marriages in our community as a covenant of faith, to pray for them in their marriage, and everything in our power, we should try to protect and uphold their marriages. But also, we should not be quick to isolate and stigmatize brothers and sisters who have been through one, because if that is your position on this, then you have put yourself in the unfortunate position of not wanting anything to do with God who calls himself a divorced person. And I just don't think that's a position where you want to be. So maybe you're sitting here and you realize that you've made some terrible mistakes, either as a married person or as a single person. You've made some errors along the way, or perhaps you're on the other side of the equation and you're saying, Justin, you just don't know what he did to me, how he treated me, how he made me feel. And you expect me just to turn around and forgive him? What am I to do with that? What am I to do with that? How do we respond in the face of such brokenness and pain? And, and here's what I want you to see. All of it finds its culmination in the person of Jesus. Here's the good news for every person in this room. Those mistakes that you have made does not mean that God is done with you because the answer to all of our mistakes is found in the gospel narrative that we already saw in the story of Hosea. Here's the essence of the gospel in a nutshell. All y'all are Gomer. All of us are Gomer in this story. We are all unfaithful people. And we are deserving of being left Right where we are, when that moment comes, who's going to buy you back from the auction? What we deserve is none of it. And yet what we find in the person of Jesus, he is the true and better Hosea. He is the one who comes to the rescue, who buys you back from the auction. And so here's the good news for all of us. You can't out the cross. You can't. You got you to preach that to your own soul. You cannot out the cross. It's the reason why Jesus came, friends. And so if you're feeling guilt, if you're feeling shame, whether it be because of marital unfaithfulness or simply unfaithfulness to God, bring that before the cross of Jesus. And if you're on the other side and you're saying, what about that person who, you know, they've harmed me, they've treated me poorly, Well, here's what I want you to see in the person of Jesus, this incredible picture. Jesus sees you, and not only that, the promise of the gospel is that he will so radically vanquish every element of torture and pain that one day you will look upon them as memorials of God's grace. That God works through even the most dire of circumstances, and once again, we see that in the cross, bloody, grotesque, Ugly, the ugliest thing you could ever see. And now we wear them around our necks and we put them up in our homes and we put them in churches. And we say, there's the message of good news. There's the message of the gospel. And every one of our stories is just like that. Even the most broken, difficult elements of our lives, God is going to remake them. And we will see them as memorials of God's grace and goodness. And that is the reason why Paul can say, friends, here's here's how I want to close today. Paul says this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. I'm talking about the church. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, King of the universe, sovereign over all, we thank you and we praise you that you are a faithful, ferociously faithful, covenant-keeping God. You are so faithful to your people, even when we collectively did not deserve it. Each and every one of us here, Lord Jesus, is like the unfaithful Gomer, And yet you have bought us back from the auction. We thank you, Lord. We ask that this message of grace would not only be heard with our ears, but it would go deep into our souls. And that we would live with grateful hearts 
as gospel-shaped people, that it would change the way in which we think about our marriage or our singleness, our finances, our lives, our relationships, and ultimately, Lord, how we treat you. And so we ask, Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would find us faithful as you indeed have been faithful to us. We pray this in Jesus' name.